hello. Um, so, I just had a question of people in the audience, if you could raise your hands. How many people here are familiar with or have used OpenStreetMap? Oh, very good. And how many people here are familiar with or have used any variety of GIS, geographic information systems? Oh, great. Then I can cancel my talk. <laughs> so, um, I, I actually didn't know who all was going to be here. And when I spoke with Dejesh and Nisha about this, I was expecting there were going to be about 20 people or so. And now there's like 200. Um, so I was going to speak about OpenStreetMap and about spatial data, sort of geographic information more generally. Um, but then I thought that I might actually talk more about my own experience as a PhD researcher, cover some of the basic GIS and OpenStreetMap kind of fundamentals, and then, uh, you know, in the third part of my talk, if I have time, I'll start running through some stuff on the web, which we could meet in the afternoon in a more informal setting with some of the other people who are here who have done work. Uh, with uh, uh, mapping and spatial data, and we can take that on. So if I don't finish by the end, at least the first two parts of the presentation should be okay. No, does this work? Wow. Okay. Um, I'm a historian. I'm doing my PhD in urban history. Uh, everything I'm going to talk about is really related to the city where I live and study, Mumbai. Um, it's broadly applicable elsewhere, but I can't really speak for more than that. And I can't also speak for uses of mapping in say, ecological or environmental things. I'm talking mostly about the urban uh, kind of arena. Um, and this is where I work, uh, in the archive of the BMC, the Bombay Municipal Corporation. And these are the kinds of archives that I deal with. Uh, they are very, very difficult to find, to access, to repaginate, um, and to make sense of. And it's a lot of really hard work that historians kind of get a kick out of doing. They're a bit like software programmers in the sense that we spend a lot of our time dealing with code. But in my case, the code is a lot of ancient, or not ancient, but sort of colonial documents uh, in the municipal corporation. Um, and it's really interesting what's happened. I mean, there's a lot of people who are always very negative about working with government, and so then you never get anything out of government. You always have to file an RTI. I've come back to India after five years, mostly of being in the US at MIT, where I was teaching and doing the other things before they actually let you do your real PhD research. And during that five years, the RTI Act has been around and been enforced throughout the country. And I've noticed a, a dramatic difference in dealing with uh, this particular office, in fact, where I used to go seeking information about the history of land, buildings, properties, tenancies, leaseholds in the city. Um, and now, actually, this type of a situation is going away now. Uh, in the government, uh, sorry, in, in the municipal corporation, but within the state of Maharashtra, there's actually been a government order going down for the past three, four years now that every municipal body, municipal corporation or council now has to install ISO certified record keeping systems classification to stem the tide of RTI requests. RTI is literally pushing a lot of these institutions into a place where they can't deal because their own record keeping practices have declined so much in the past 20 to 30 years. There are different explanations for that. A lot of it has to do with language and English. Um, I don't think it has so much to do with corruption as, as with general overall inefficiency. And I happen to have been lucky to have been working in the municipal corporation at a time when these new record rooms are actually being set up. So I get access to all sorts of wonderful data. And most data that is about cities is also about space. It can be mapped. Um, so I'm going to just run through some of my own experiences of dealing with a few different types of databases, some from the municipal corporation uh, having to do with property, some from the collector's office, which is a revenue department dealing with land, and also transport data from the BST, the best, which is Bombay's bus company, and a project that I've been running with some of my friends for the past few months called Chalo Best. Um, <clears throat> This is normally the problem that we've had for the past few years, is that where do we first get our data? Uh, there's a whole group of us who spend a lot of time writing a lot of custom scripts to scrape data off of government websites. Because before you could actually walk into a government office with a pen drive and they would actually give you something, which they do now, uh, we had no other option but to do this. This is an example of uh, get your property card online. You go to this website, which is a really, really badly designed website by the National Informatics Center, totally insecure. Uh, you type in your cadastral survey number, and it gives you, it's not very legible, but it gives you an entire ownership history. It gives you every detail about it going back to the old British surveys of the 1870s and 1930s. Now, what I didn't realize when I first looked at this website is that every one of these pages has a unique URL. 
So that meant that I could actually sit for one night, write a script, and download all of them and put them into a database that I could then search for myself. Because I was interested in the history of land holding patterns in the city, and I had no data to deal with. I mean, I had those big archives, the big sort of, you know, this type of stuff. But, you know, I didn't actually have something that I could search or discover things easily with, or establish patterns or trends or make, make connections, which is what all researchers basically do. Uh, so I sat one night with a bunch of my friends and hackers, and we actually spidered the entire NIC database, dumped it all into a, a, a you know sort of a backend, and we created a very simple web admin that actually allowed me to search through it and find very interesting patterns. I learned actually that about 40% of the island city of Mumbai is owned by ghosts and zombies. These people don't <laughs> exist anymore. They are no longer the holders of the properties in, in question, but their names are still on the books, and the names are actually still on the website. Uh, including, I found a friend of mine's grandfather who passed away in the 1950s, still owns a building right down the street from my house. Um, so these are the kinds of interesting, kind of fun experiments that I got involved with. But I never had a map to connect this to. These were all tabular databases, the big lists of stuff, right? Uh, in this case, having to deal with sort of property. Um, then I went actually searching for map data from the municipal corporation and through some contacts with some, in fact, Zainab was talking about the, the slum toilet study that we did. The same engineer who we worked with to do that study several years ago privately one day kind of called me to his office and he said, bring your pen drive. Um, and he actually gave me all of this spatial data of Mumbai. Now, it's beautiful stuff. I mean, you can't really see it if you could actually see it in, in higher resolution. It's absolutely <coughs> stunning. I mean, it's, it's every building in the city. Now, the thing is that this is not really spatial data. It's just a bunch of drawings in AutoCAD. They don't have lat-long you know, coordinates on them. They're not georeferenced. You can't really do anything with this except look at it and you know, it looks really nice and you can color it and style it in different ways. None of these buildings are actually closed polygons, so I can't treat them as data objects. So thus, and this was only just about five, six years ago, I decided to teach myself GIS. How could I fix this and connect it to real tabular data so that I could actually map out these types of trends? And then I went to MIT and I sat in the GIS lab for two years and figured out this is the wrong way of doing things. Uh, but in the meantime, I figured out how to do, deal with spatial data. Um, <clears throat> This is actually what that what, what you previously just saw is actually generated from this, which is the development plan for Greater Mumbai, which actually you see all of these color codings and symbologies on the side are for reserving certain lands for certain purposes, whether it's for education, open space, civic amenities, hospitals, clinics, whatever. Right? Each of them has got a code. Each of them has got a certain type of uh, uh, reservation that is, is guaranteed by law. And the municipal corporation actually uses this to vet every building proposal in the city and any type of land development. Now, most people have not seen their own DP sheet. There are about 270 odd of them that cover the entire Greater Mumbai area, but you wouldn't actually know where all the gardens and parks in your area are supposed to be unless you look at this. And most of the time, they're not actually there. They've been encroached, they've been sold, they've been, I mean, you must have heard about the Adash housing scams, so I don't need to tell you about Mumbai. Now, this was the thing that I went back to the municipal corporation to find out. Do they have even more data that I could possibly link to certain types of geographic attributes and approach this problem in a different way? Again, I guess the resolution is not very good. Uh, this is a fantastic thing that I just got a few months ago after a bit of plotting with the chief accountant's office. It is a listing of the ownership and tenancy history of every plot in the island city of Mumbai in a gigantic Excel spreadsheet. Um, it's really, really exciting. I know it doesn't sound like it, um, but I don't know how to map this. I don't even know where most of these places are unless I go back and look at survey sheets and I take this number and I actually kind of go through it and figure out where that number is. So it's a very, very painstaking manual process. These are the types of survey sheets that have the plot numbers on them. This, in fact, is my own neighborhood. My house is right down here. Um, and I was thinking to myself, then now, okay, I've got this one big database on the other side. I've got these old survey sheets with these numbers. Again, how do I map this? Um, and this is still a problem that I myself am trying to solve, and which I think a lot of other people who have got big databases that they want to map out or that do have spatial attributes will have the same kind of itch that they need to scratch. One way of doing this is, oh my god, this is really terrible. So this is an open street map, uh, the exact same survey sheet that you just saw. Uh, Oh no. It's the spinning wheel of death. <laughs> so this survey sheet is this in OpenStreetMap. And if you can see here, 
I've actually gone and hand, started hand numbering every building. I've drawn all of these buildings myself as well because I'm studying this neighborhood and the history of land and property development and architecture there. This is very, very painstaking, but after you sit back in, of an evening and look at the work that you've done, it can be highly rewarding also if you're into maps. Um, and this, that's the type of energy and itch scratching that the OpenStreetMap project is built upon. People who have a real passion to explore, document, tag, annotate their own spaces. And if you connect that enthusiasm to the kind of public databases that are now becoming available, not really through RTI, because RTI is kind of like a, you know, it's like a single shot pistol. You can just ask for one thing and you get it or you don't get it. But what we need is more of like an automatic weapon sort of approach where we can actually get these big databases from the municipal corporation and parse them in certain sort of uh, machine readable ways. Um, and that's really the big problem. Uh, so I'll just, uh, well, I'm going to go back to that. Um, <clears throat> this is my final example of dealing with the transportation database because the resolution on this is not very good again, so you can't see. But this is the BST, the Bombay Bus Company's master atlas for running every bus in, in Greater Mumbai. Uh, it runs into about a thousand rows. It's got very, very precise timings, as you can see, for uh, headway and runtime. Uh, but this is, again, very, very difficult data to deal with because this is maintained every month by the bus company, and it's used as a way for them to keep tabs on their depot managers and make sure that the efficiency of services is balancing the load of passengers and things like that. So it's a really, really nice set of data, but if you'll notice here, there are a lot of missing values for headways at certain times of day that we've had to develop logic and code to compensate for that to make this machine readable and be able to pipe it out into things like Google Maps and OpenStreetMap and certain routing algorithms. <clears throat> it's a very, very difficult problem, but it's not insurmountable, particularly if the authorities start sharing data in these types of formats with you. Um, so, and this is, this is the most lovely thing that the BST has ever given to us, which is a list of all of the bus stops in Bombay with their names on them, as well as all of the routes that are there. So what we've actually done in this project that I'm running in collaboration with the BST and a group of people that's supported by IHS, it's called Chalo Best, is that we've actually now gone and mapped out most of these stops. Built a very simple web interface around this public database, and I think you can see it, yeah. It was also online, actually, the URL's there. Um, and over about a week or so, we just threw it out there, had groups of students come over to our lab in the evening, and if they were from a certain area, I mean, I may know the bus stops in my own locality of Bombay, but I don't know where every bus stop in the city is located. I don't know anyone who does, but everyone knows their area. Um, so what we did was that we just built a very simple, quick and dirty web interface to browse this database and plop down points on the map and put them back into the database for later use. <clears throat> But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. It's a very, very difficult process, especially making the maps in the absence of spatial data that comes to us from the authorities, who actually have this data, in spite of the fact that I know a lot of people in the municipal corporation. I've been working there as a PhD researcher for two years, and I know that they have what are called the shape files, which are actually the georeference vector data for all of Greater Mumbai. <laughs> One of the, the, the engineers who was there, I, you know, he, he often shares stuff with me, and he's like, I can't give you this. We won't even give it to MMRDA or the state government or the Slum Rehabilitation Authority. Why would we give it to you? <laughs> so that's the objective situation. It's not that the data is not there, and there are ways of getting at it, and I'm for the next few months, I'll keep trying to get it somehow, and I might be successful. And when I am, then that actually makes a lot of this work that I was just describing much, much easier. In fact, it obviates most of the stuff that I had to teach myself GIS to actually figure out how to do, which was to map out property databases in the city. Uh, this is the, the, the Mumbai City Collector. This is where everyone comes to do a title search for their properties. And this place is like walking into like a Dickens novel, the way that you know all these petitioners are around, and these you know ancient sort of registers that they have to pull off of these racks that are all written in longhand English that even I can't read. I mean, let alone a clerk who basically only speaks Marathi. Um, so this is really, you know, my friends in the U.S. keep telling me, well, what are all the digital archives out there? I was like, this is a hell of a lot more fun than a digital archive, you know, if you're into the thrill of the hunt. Um, so to go back, now I'm going to kind of change gears a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the shape files that you mentioned, uh, do, they have a, uh, do they have any kind of portal uh, where they have saved it? Because I was trying to do it in the state of UP, and at least they have a GIS unit called SISTI. 
was with DDS, officer in the NIC, hmm. Lucknow office. <coughs> but he, I, I asked him the same thing, give me the safe funds. He said, we cannot, but uh, what we can do is collaborate with you and give, uh, uh, host the application and let the application use uh, the files. So maybe that is one thing. See, I think every state is different, and every every uh, uh, body is also different. You know, I have uh, been really impressed with how accountable and friendly the BMC is, which everyone thinks is the most corrupt body in India, whatever, whatever, all the complaints of middle class people. But compared to state government agencies in Mumbai, where they are complete, they shut the door in your face, and they don't even entertain your request. So I think that it really varies, you know, but at, up until this point, for spatial data, Except for parliamentary constituencies and district boundaries, uh, and district boundaries were available as shape files online a couple of years ago. They've now been taken offline. Luckily, I downloaded them then. Um, <laughs> uh, it's still not. We're still not there. Though there is, you know, open data. Spatial data has particular characteristics. When you say, "Give me a map," we don't want a PDF or a JPEG. We want a shape file. So I'm going to get into some of that now. That's so, okay. what the fish is GIS? Um, just for those of you who don't know and to bring all of us onto the same page, um, there's a big difference between old school GIS, geographic information systems, and what a lot of people for the past five to say seven years now are calling neo-geography, which is the sort of web 2.0 uh, crowdsourcing, open street map uh, whole trend, right? But the real crucial kind of conceptual difference uh, is actually about how we treat the map. And I think Google Maps and Google Earth sort of stand somewhere in between GIS and Neo Geography, and that Google Maps and Google Earth have really democratized the use of maps and the availability of particularly satellite imagery, which has been around for decades, but there was never any way to serve it to people easily, you know, through some technology like the, the, the web. You know, you needed even broadband to run Google Earth, which most of us didn't have five years ago. And maps themselves being large printed documents which are incredibly detailed and re require a high amount of sort of you know, persistence to be legible and uh, you know can be interpreted in millions of different ways. Even once you get them online, they don't. It doesn't make them any more easy to discern or or interpret, right? I mean, maps are a very unique form of media. They're not like print. They're not like video. They're not like audio in that sense, which are much more easily delivered over the web. So, OpenStreetMap has really come into a point where, and I'll kind of go into OSM a bit, where we're actually looking at maps not as a read-only medium, but as a read-write medium. Um, so now I need to go fast. Why not Photoshop, Cat, or Illustrator? Most of you would know that because they're not actually geographic drawing tools, they're just drawing tools. Um, every data needs to be georeferenced to be used spatially. And why not Google Maps, Google Earth? I mean, I have nothing wrong with them, uh, but the ownership of the data is an issue. Um, OpenStreetMap, like Wikipedia, is community owned. Um, and you can actually make your own maps and tell your own stories through OpenStreetMap. So, as everyone knows, the sort of holy trinity for those of us from the free software movement, um, everything is based on free and open source software. I don't need to tell you guys about that. Um, open data formats and standards obviously are crucial, but even more so in the realm of GIS, because as I said, if you know, a government agency gives you a map, which is a PDF versus giving you a shapefile, they're empowering you in a totally different way with the raw data. Um, and we need to use these sorts of shared models, standards, services to kind of keep everything in, in sort of sync. Um, and open and public data, of course, is the foundation of this. None of what I've been able to do would have been possible just by scraping websites. Once I start getting actually tabular data in a certain form from the authorities is when the fun begins, like say with the BST. So these are the types, again, this is a very technical thing, just running through the different types of spatial and geographic data. There's raster imagery, which is basically pixel images. There are vector features, which are like line point drawings. And there's tabular data, right? Your lists, your tables, your spreadsheets, whatever, right? And the, the point of GIS or of mapping is to bring these things together, right? Every object on the map is also an entry in the database. Um, and every object in the map is represented in only one of three ways. It's either a point, or it's a line, which is a set of points, or it's a polygon, which is a closed line, right? So actually, they're all derivatives of one thing, which is a point, which is a latitude, longitude point. And those of you who use GPS and all of that would be familiar with how that works. So everything is a combination of these three essential geographic building blocks as far as features are concerned, features that is geographic features. <coughs> and these are the sort of file formats and standards that many of you who 
have done some work with geographic data or have heard about it would be familiar with. Uh, the file formats, of course, shapefiles, GeoTIFF, GPX is what comes off of a GPS device. And these are all the open formats and web services that actually power the delivery of map data, particularly over the web, but also through database servers. And this is how it all fits together, another kind of nice technical diagram, which is actually now quite dated. This is from about four years ago, and in fact, the situation has dramatically simplified in the world of open source geospatial software. So we can maybe talk more about that in a breakout session in the afternoon, those of us who have worked with it. So this is my last slide. Um, this is, does anybody know who this is? Does anybody know where this is? New York. New York, right. I'm really interested in New York, not only because I've lived there, but because like Mumbai, it's an island city that had a very constrained ecology and which was subject to a high amount of capitalist violence. Um, and this guy was one of the guys who was the main architect of that. Between about 1940 and 1970, his name was Robert Moses. He was the guy who built all the flyovers. He also preserved a lot of really beautiful parks. He laid uh, the foundations for all of the bridges and everything that now connect Manhattan with Brooklyn, with Queens, with Long Island, with its hinterland. Um, and there's a great book about him which won the Pulitzer Prize called The Power Broker, about how he accumulated this kind of bureaucratic authority, simply because all of the agencies that he was dealing with were so scattered and fragmented that they didn't understand the city's territory and geography. And he had a really, really good and passionate understanding of maps, and he was also a champion swimmer who used to swim through the rivers in the Long Island Sound, actually. So uh, he was someone with a high, high degree of geographic awareness at a time when no one else did, and he used it for generally what is agreed to be a very bad thing, like basically promoting cars, <clears throat> keeping poor people off of the beaches, that sort of thing. So we don't like him, but he's the type of person who sits in every MMRDA, B BDA, whatever type of authority, the technocrat. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, the idea is that to take the power out of the hands of these people and put it in the hands of people like us, right? To free them up, empower your community, whoever that may be. Uh, since the community is a term that could apply to your clients, it could apply to slum dwellers, it's whoever you want, but they will be empowered. Uh, get out of the house and explore. It's a good way to get out, go mapping. Um, it also helps to unlock a certain knowledge that we all have about our local environments, but we often don't actually put down in writing or put down on the map. Uh, where are the locations of certain cultural institutions, social institutions, that sort of thing. And geodata is a public good, it's not a commodity. And in India, it's still treated like that. Uh, yeah? Oh, oh, what happened? Oh my god. You ruined my presentation. Well, it was almost over anyway. Um, there you go. Uh, so, actually, I'm just going to spend two minutes, can I spend two minutes? Um, just showing some stuff on the web. Um, and starting with a, a big plug for, where's Jace? Yeah, for Hasdi Crew, um, who organized this excellent workshop with a group of friends of mine a few weeks ago. Um, if you guys want to know more about uh, geodata and stuff like that and all the tools that I just very quickly ran through have a look at this website and uh, talk to Kiran or Zainab or anyone else who's here. Um, this is, God, everything's really off-center now. Um, okay, so maybe this is better done in a smaller room, but I'm just going to run through very quickly some of the tools that are out there now for doing this. Tile Mill, also called, I mean, supported by a company called Mapbox. Uh, is a really, really excellent tool for getting started with doing uh, maps online. Oh. Just press the zoom button. Which zoom button? The window zoom button. Top left corner. Control minus. Even I don't know that. Uh, okay, anyway. Uh, this is the... That's much better. Um, right, so this is Tile Mill. This is a little bit more of Tile Mill. You can actually go to this site and have a look at mapbox.com. Um, these are the types of maps that you can do with Tile Mill in a very simple way if you have um, uh, uh, like CSV data, you know, spreadsheets, lists, that sort of thing. Oh, wait. Okay, sorry. I'm just going next. Um, and these are just some examples of thematic maps uh, that can be made with Tile Mill of different places. 
Uh, Polymaps is also a really nice JavaScript library for styling maps. Um, you can also have a look at this. These are all different sorts of stylings that can be done. If you have data uh, that can be used, even if you don't have a lot of spatial data, you can still do a lot in terms of actually telling stories with maps um, using uh, polymaps. Um, the, this is a tool that I have helped to develop for the New York Public Library um, called the Map Warper, which actually allows you to take any scanned image and geo-reference it by pointing and clicking a bunch of points in common on a map. Um, and then what it does is that it gives you an overlay. Oh my god, well, broken. Um, it allows you to overlay uh, scanned imagery on top of actual uh, maps. So you can see that's OpenStreetMap in the background, and this is a city survey map from the 1960s of Mumbai, which I actually found in a library in Chicago. Um, <laughs> But this is really cool, and this is very helpful. Um, I can show people how to use this later on in the afternoon. Uh, GeoDango is a web framework that is increasingly popular. It's what I use to build some of my, the property card database and what we're doing with Chalo Best. Um, this is an example of what GeoDango can do. These are all the bus stops that I mentioned. And we're actually uh, using the, the BST database as a kind of a baseline. This is all of the official data. We're adding Marathi uh, transliterations, um, and we're actually adding locations to this as well, which I showed you with, with the other interface. Um, yeah. Yes, and this is that, that stop editor interface, which I also showed. Everything's awesome. <coughs> and this is OpenStreetMap. I haven't gotten this. This is the same map that I was showing you earlier, but this is actually the editor interface. And so probably in the afternoon, those of you who are not familiar with editing OSM or tags and things like that, uh, we, can, we can go through that um, uh, sort of in a smaller uh, group. And uh, do I have time to take questions? Uh, sure. Until I set up this. Okay. So until, uh, okay, until you set up this, right? So then I'm just going to play this video. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, oh, you're going to have to disconnect. Okay. And I can't do that. Anyway. I was going to show you the OSM change history for one year on a globe, but okay. Sorry. So, are there any questions? I, I'll send the links around. Um, I will Actually, post it on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. I'll be posting all the links and the PowerPoint that I just showed, um, and send it around. Sorry. Is it public information? Has it, can you put it up online somewhere in the link? I could. <laughs> <laughs> but why would I? <laughs> it's public information because I got it from government, right? I mean, the question is really, do I have the rights to republish it? I don't know. Right? I mean, that's, that's a really good question of what is public. If, if someone, in a, if a BMC officer gives you a big spreadsheet on a pen drive, is that public information? But then the question is, is information derived from that data publishable? That, that is one thing that I've got a clearer question on, at least as far as transport data is concerned. The BST has told us that we don't want you sharing our raw database, but whatever, whatever you want to put out on your API, enhanced and augmented in your own ways, you're free to do. But I don't know about these property databases. I mean, I'm sure that every builder in the city has got it on his hard disk already. So. <laughs> process of research is always about making interesting and unconventional connections between things, whether it's bits of data or different arguments about things. And I think that I got into this not with the idea of making it all public, which I think is an interesting byproduct of my research, but, and I would like to make it public, but essentially it was a tool for me to understand the city's history. And as I said, I'm still struggling towards that because the data is not there in a way that I could do that. In New York City, for instance, where I've worked with the New York Public Library, we have a historical GIS project that's been going on for three years, 
where we've got building level histories. I mean, every building is a database also, full of stories, right, about the past. Um, so is every building in Bombay, but we don't have a framework for doing that yet. Um, so I think that a historical GIS for me would have helped me in my PhD research. Unfortunately, I have to submit by this summer, so I can't keep doing this type of stuff. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, I would like to put it out as and when I'm, I'm happy with the results of, of the mapping. Okay, fair enough. Thank you.